I'm glad you could be with us today. So welcome back to the study of constitutional law. Specifically, in this semester, we will be looking at subnational constitutional law. Ain't that a fancy term? I like to use fancy terms now and then try to look educated. So we'll be looking at subnational constitutional law, by which I mean we'll be looking at state constitutions. And since the title of the course is Florida Constitutional Law, I thought I might put a particular emphasis on that particular constitution. Sound good? All right, so that's what we will do. Another thing we will do is I know that you come to this class after having a background in our federal constitution. Anybody here unaware of the fact that the United States has a federal constitution? Okay, good, no hands went up. Whew, I always stress over that one. Okay, good. So you know there's a federal constitution. Maybe you even took a class studying the federal constitution. If that's true, go ahead and raise your hand. I know I did. All right, a lot of you did. A lot of you did. A lot of you did. Maybe even most of you did. Pretty close to all of you did. This is good. This is good. So I intend to draw upon the knowledge that you already have. I 
think that's important to do because you need that knowledge of the federal constitution to pass whatever state bar exam you're going to take. Likewise, if you're going to take the Florida bar, you're going to need the knowledge of Florida's constitution to pass that bar exam. So I will do my best to compare and contrast the, the two constitutions. That serves two purposes. First, it draws upon the knowledge that you already have. Second, it helps you to distinguish the two so that you don't mix them up, so that you don't mistakenly believe that when I tell you what's going on in the state constitution and how it works there, I don't want you to mistakenly think that it's the same way under the federal constitution and how it works there. So I'll do my best to always point out those differences for those two reasons. And the most important reason we're all here, and you know what that reason is, right? Required class. Yeah, required class. And, and I respect that. I respect that perhaps not every single member of my audience wants to go on and practice subnational constitutional law as their specialty. I respect that. So I will do my best to be practical in this class. And perhaps maybe even that's my strength. I don't know. I am not a professor by day. I am an attorney. I am here playing a professor on Wednesday nights. So thank you for coming to the show. But I've been practicing law for 25 years. I am your friendly neighborhood bar grievance defense attorney, by which I mean I defend my fellow members of the Florida Bar and the District of Columbia Bar against bar grievances and ethics complaints. Stated somewhat differently when a lawyer needs a lawyer they call me, hopefully me. I prefer if they call me. So that's what I do by day. And I also love to write. Anyone else here love legal research and writing? Come on, there's gotta be a hand. There's one hand, thank you, thank you for that hand. So I'm not alone, but I'm crazy enough to write in my spare time. It's what I love to do. And one of my favorite topics is subnational constitutional law. I love to write things about Florida's constitution. So. With any luck, I have enough skill and I have enough experience and I have enough knowledge to pass on to you what you need to know to pass whatever bar exam that you might take. But there is a secret, if you will, to my success, if to the extent that I have any. There's a secret to my strength, to the extent those days that I, I stay strong. And I hope by now you know the name of that secret. His name is Jesus Christ. And I begin every class with a prayer because I want to call upon him to send us his blessing, to give us his strength. I believe that the practice of law can be a noble profession, can be a wonderful way to serve our fellow man. And I have nothing but respect for each and every one of you who have graduated from a fine university, have earned a bachelor's degree, have all the job opportunities in the world right now, but yet have put your careers on hold to come here and learn to be a lawyer. I'm like you, I've seen the world. Just like you, I know that there is injustice in this world. Has anyone here seen injustice worked upon another? Raise your hand, keep that hand up. Has anyone here had injustice upon themselves? Raise your hand, keep the hand up. I dare say there's not a person without a hand up. So I know that injustice exists. But I refuse to believe that the Lord our God has abandoned us to a world of injustice because year after year as I do this teaching in my part time, I see good people like you who want to fight the good fight and want to do what they can to carry the cross of their clients and to bring justice to this world. So for that reason, I am here to serve you because by serving you, I serve Christ and I'm here to help you. So as the semester progresses, let me know how best I can serve you. Let me know how best I can help you. And one thing you can do for me, if you don't mind indulging me, is that I like to begin every class with a prayer. Please do not feel out of place. Please do not feel awkward. Please do not feel offended by that. Because I'm not up here praying at you. I'm up here praying for you. I know that we all come from different faith backgrounds or no faith at all. And I respect that. I love you just the same. I don't love you because you're Catholic. I love you because I'm Catholic. And loving my fellow man is what a Catholic is called to do. So whatever background you come from, if you're kind enough to indulge me while I begin every class with the prayer, I'll be very thankful for that courtesy. I'm not praying at you, I'm praying for you. Or if you choose to join me, totally optional. If you choose to join me, then I'm praying with you. 
And as always, I pray in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired by that confidence, I fly unto you, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To you do I come, before you I stand sinful and sorrowful. O Mother, the Word incarnate, despise not my petition, but in your mercy hear and answer me. And my petition, as always, is to give me the knowledge, make me clear my teachings, help me to help my students understand well the topic they've chosen to study. And ask your son, Blessed Mother, to send his angels to help these students in their studies, in their works, and in their efforts to serve the Lord. And I ask this in the name of your son, my Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Perhaps by now you've cracked a book. And that book has to do with Florida's Constitution. But let's begin at the beginning, shall we? Let's begin with the concepts of federalism and state constitutions. Let's begin by noting this document. Have you seen this one before? What is that? That's the US Constitution. It's okay if you didn't recognize it. I've learned as I've taught this class over the years that many of us have spent hours upon hours studying the federal constitution, but never actually read its words. Many of us have taken federal con law classes in law school, which never asked the students to read the words of the federal constitution. Let's be honest. If you'll be honest, raise your hand if you were in a class where you studied the federal constitution and reading the document was not required. Come on. Thank you. This class is different. I'm going to ask you to read Florida's Constitution. I have even worse news for you. By far, it's longer than the federal constitution. <laughs> much, much longer. But I begin at the beginning, and I begin with the question, why do we have state constitutions? Why? And if you've cracked a book, you've seen that that's how I open the first chapter of our book. And I note what the historians would say. How would the historians answer that question? Why are there state constitutions? The historian would say, well, before there was a United States of America, there were a bunch of ununited states of America. 13 colonies sound familiar to anyone. Anyone take high school civics in the USA? You may have covered this. Yeah, and each was its own sovereign. And together they formed a more perfect union, right? So before there was a federal constitution, there were states. And before the federal constitution, there were state constitutions. The historian tells us, well, that's, that's why they exist. Thank you, Mr. Historian. But if you don't mind me asking, Miss Historian, then why are they still around today? Next, I talk about how the pragmatist might answer that question. The pragmatist might say, well, why do we have state constitutions? The pragmatist answers, they serve a purpose. They give us a source of organic law for the states. They give us structure to state governments. They spell out that there are parts of government and what parts there are. They spell out the rights and duties of those parts of government. And thank you, Ms. Pragmatist, that's certainly describes what we see when we read the state constitution. But Mr. Pragmatist, if you don't mind me asking, why do we need that to be in a separate document? Are there nations where they have subnational units where their constitutions are just paragraphs within the federal constitution? Of course there are. 
You don't have to look much further than our good friends to the north. Anyone ever heard of a nation called Canada? Yeah, yeah. And they have provinces, maybe they'll call them states, but they're subnational governments. And their constitutions, if you will, are paragraphs within the federal constitution. So Mr. Pragmatist, Ms. Pragmatist, I don't think you answered my question either. So I return to the question, why do we have state constitutions? And I suggest that there's only one true answer to this that goes beyond what the pragmatist does and gives us the nuts and bolts of what we see in the state constitution. Go beyond what the historian does, which tells us the origin, but not the persistence. I find this answer to be most fruitful. We have subnational constitutions because of the human need for subsidiarity. Subsidiarity. That phrase sounds a lot like subsidiary, but it's a different concept. Not totally unrelated, but a different concept. The concept of subsidiarity comes from Catholic social justice teaching. Has anyone heard the term before tonight? If you crack the book, it's on page one. <laughs> Don't forget to read the book. <laughs> Subsidiarity, as described in St. Pope John Paul II's 1991 encyclical, Centesimus Annus, means that a community of a higher order should not interfere in the eternal life of a community of a lower order depriving the latter of its functions, but rather should support it and help to coordinate its activity with the activities of the rest of society, always with a view toward the common good. Wow, well said, St. Pope John Paul II. But that's a lot of words right there. McGinley, can you, TLDR, can you give me a summary here? And to summarize, or to state somewhat differently, Subsidiarity means that local problems sometimes require local solutions. Is that a perfect summary? No. Does it leave out a lot of details? Yes. But it's a nice working knowledge to begin. So subsidiarity tells us that local problems sometimes require local solutions. Subsidiarity is more than just a political science concept because subsidiarity has to do with human dignity. Subsidiarity has to do with the rights of individuals. Think about it. As an individual, you have certain rights from God. Do you not? Do you surrender all those rights simply by joining an organization, being part of a club, being a member of a family, being a resident of a city, happen to reside within a state. Is that enough for you to lose your basic human dignity and your rights? I dare say no. Subsidiarity helps to recognize that fact. If people with God-given rights come together in a subnational unit, Maybe that's a corporation. Maybe that's a family. Maybe that's a religious order. Maybe that's a nonprofit organization. Maybe that's a city or a county or a state. We still have to respect the basic human rights of those individuals, despite the fact that they came together. Subsidiarity is the concept by which we recognize those rights. So subsidiarity then rejects totalitarianism and fascism. It rejects the notion that all problem solving should be vested only in the highest sovereign or federal authority. Instead, subsidiarity is gonna respect the proper role of problem solving by states, counties, cities, and where appropriate, non-governmental organizations, private industry, religious institutions, corporations, families, all of these subnational units need to not be extinguished and quashed and under the rigid micromanaged control of one sovereign authority because to do so eliminates our basic human rights. 
That's the concept of subsidiarity. There are three fundamental principles of Catholic social teaching that are on par with subsidiarity. It does not stand alone. It's on equal footing with two other principles, solidarity and human dignity. Now, Pope Benedict XVI gave us a great working definition of all three of those terms. Human dignity is the intrinsic value of a person created in the image and likeness of God and redeemed by Christ. Solidarity refers to the virtue enabling the human family to share fully the treasure of material and spiritual goods. Subsidiarity, then, is the coordination of society's activities in a way that supports the internal life of local communities while they in turn advance the concepts of human dignity and solidarity. So don't misinterpret subsidiarity to mean, well, we give greater rights to groups than we do individuals. No, 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 that's a misunderstanding of subsidiarity. Don't misunderstand subsidiarity to mean that it is more important than basic human dignity. No, no. Subsidiarity is a means by which we enforce and support human dignity. Subsidiarity is never properly a way to deny human dignity. And subsidiarity stands in footing with solidarity. A question. Yes, sir. Awesome. Oh, I have to interrupt you because you're the first question, so you got to give me one I know how to answer. Someone's waiting in the waiting room, okay. On the Zoom, okay. Someone's waiting in the waiting room on the Zoom, okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Well, to all our Zoom watchers, welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Never been a big fan of Zoom, but uh, okay. So we've got that. All right. Well, uh, I, it sounds as if you may have communication with the, with the waiting room Zoom folks. Okay, all right. Will you reach out to them? Tell them uh, that I express my apologies, uh, that I, I got a couple other folks waiting also for me to talk. <laughs> Out of respect for them, I'm going to go on and that I apologize that they missed any, but they can feel free to join us live on YouTube and they won't miss a thing. But if they prefer to be in the waiting room and not on YouTube, I respect that. Our next break's coming up in about 40 minutes, and I'm going to reach out to whatever virtual room they're in and, and virtually greet them with, with all my virtual help. But thank you. Thank you for pointing that out, and thank you for reaching out to them. Yeah. But now, solidarity and subsidiarity can go hand in hand, as Pope Francis reminds us in a tweet. Can't have a lecture nowadays without some Twitter, right? So here it is from the Twitter feed. <laughs> solidarity needs subsidiarity. There is no true solidarity without social participation, without the contribution of families, associations, cooperatives, small businesses, and other expressions of society. Says the Holy Father in a tweet he sent out. Did you know the Holy Father tweets? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Holy Father tweets. In a tweet he sent out at 7.30 a.m., Man starts his work day early. When you're working for the man, you got to get up early, right? 7.30 a.m. on September 23rd, 2020, according to my screenshot there. Who's going to argue with a screenshot? Right? Yeah, screenshots, that's proof. Yeah. So solidarity, human dignity, subsidiarity, none outranks the other, none outweighs the other. Think of the three as legs on a three-legged stool. Ever sit on a stool that instead of four legs has three? Every leg's critical now, right? Knock one of the three legs off a three-legged stool, then what happens? Then you come falling off your bar stool, right? And at that point, they're not serving you anymore, Miller High Life. They're cutting you off. And when it's time to relax, one beer stands clear. If you have the time, we have the beer, Miller Beer. I want to thank my sponsor. <laughs> Just kidding. I, I hope you know by now there's a lot of humor in this class and some of it's deliberate, so. 
Okay, it's best that guy. All right, so solidarity, subsidiarity, human dignity. All three stand together. And I suggest all three explain the persistence of state constitutions. So that's why my scholarship focuses on subsidiarity. Mostly I practice law, I do that about 60 hours a week, but I like to write in my spare time. And when I do, most of my writing somehow leads back to that pet concept of mine, subsidiarity. Uh, for example, when I was in law school, I wrote this law review article here that was 1995 that got published. You can see why I'm wearing the bifocals now, right? 1995. And I called the article Beyond Healthcare Reform. Because back in 95, we'd solved the healthcare problem. That's still solved, right? <laughs> yeah, beyond healthcare reform. Talked about their certificates of need. This was permission from the government. You couldn't add a hospital bed. You couldn't add more square footage to the emergency room. You couldn't add another nursing home bed unless you successfully applied for and won a certificate of need from the government. My article, Beyond Healthcare Reform, attacked this system. We should have respect for healthcare providers. Anyone here respect healthcare providers? Raise your hand. Yeah. If they know that we need more square footage in the ER, let them have it. If they know we need another bed in the hospital, let them have it. Government should pipe out. That was my, my law school naivete. But I still believe it. Then I got to write this book called Florida Workers' Compensation. It's a two-volume book, which is about 4,800 pages. But of course, that's not enough, so it has a compendium, Foreign Insurance Law, with my co-authors in that book. And there I talk about how the social safety net of society, in many instances, can be effectively done by the private sector. If you know anything about the workers' compensation law, there are those success stories. There are those instances where, despite the fact that it's private insurers, they are sufficient social safety net for the disabled and those with disabilities and those who have workplace accidents. And I took the same focus in my particular chapters of Florida insurance law. I wrote a book called Florida Elements of and Action. Very modest goal here. I just wanted to identify, clarify, and classify every cause of action available within the state of Florida. <laughs> Been at it for 12 years. Haven't quite finished that book yet, but I reprint it every year. <laughs> I'm up to 80. Nine, if I have the count right, causes of action so far. A couple of years ago, my goal was to hit 100. I haven't even hit that goal yet. But there, I want to be a guide to my fellow practitioners, maybe even to judges, so that they can properly apply the laws of the state, so that they can be an effective subnational unit, so that they can advance the concepts of subsidiarity. And then I, that led me to Florida municipal law and practice, which in turn led me to a book called Florida's, Interpreting Florida's Constitution, and that set me down the path of constitutional law. That's when I started to write about our state constitution. And I haven't quit since. Uh, you may notice the author of the book you're using there, and my name are quite similar. I wrote that one. Yeah, that's me. I was going to put my face on the, on the cover, but I didn't want to scare people off and keep them up in there. Yeah. And then my latest law review article, which I added to the syllabus, and I didn't do that at a vanity. I think I really do have something to discuss with you there. That talks about a particular right within Florida's constitution. That talks about access to courts. And it talks about how, in a substantive way, access to courts is more than just a state constitution's reprinting of the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's more than just physical access to the courts. It's more than just having the doors wide enough and the ramps at the right level. It's about whether or not we can take an existing cause of action and abolish it. And under what terms can we do so? And that's when I started to do what the academics do, counting how many angels can stand on the head of a pin of a needle. I really started to dive into the topic there. So with any luck, I've been doing the work Coin a phrase, I made that up. Never heard that phrase before, did you? I've been doing the work so that I can be prepared to be a good servant to you and hopefully give you a good class.
but it's subsidiarity that rings through all of my work. Why is that good for you to know? Well, if you happen to be taking my midterm exam and my final exam, you might want to make note of that. Also, we've got a graded essay project due in a few weeks. And what was that about? Man, nobody read the syllabus either. Somebody said it. Subsidiarity, thank you. Yes. So if for no other reason, then you got to crank out a good essay. <laughs> Let's learn the topic, shall we? <laughs> I noticed these batteries were dead before I started, but you ever do that thing where you just turn them around and they work again? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. They told me to bring my own slides. They didn't tell me to bring my own clicker. That's all right. There's a keyboard, too. I mean, there's a lot of facilities here. What do you think of this room? Is this room beautiful or what? It's a beautiful room. I, I, I've, I've admired this room before. Uh, they've done uh, mass here in this room. So my wife, Bernadette, and I were sitting right by where you are. So they did mass here. And now I get to teach right here. I tell you, I, I'm so humbled and flattered to be able to do that for you. Okay. So subsidiarity, then let's return to... Pope St. John Paul II's definition. And as I do that, you mentioned our folks who are watching from a distance. I think they're having trouble reading that slide. Forgive me while I move their camera. Oh, and you all watching, forgive me as the camera moves. Okay, let's see if we can give them a, yeah, they can read that slide a lot better. Okay, all right. No, it's not my fault. So subsidiarity, let's break that definition down, shall we? Now, you remember I had a summary for you. And what was that summary? Sometimes local problems need local solutions. But I warned you, that summary is too concise. It leaves off too many details. Let's take a look, then, at this definition a little closer. Subsidiarity, as described as St. Pope John Paul II, says a community of higher order should not interfere should not interfere. Is subsidiarity a justification for, for example, a sanctuary city? Have you seen the news? It's in the news sometimes. Sometimes a city will say, well, you know, we're a city and we pass ordinances. You'll learn later in this class that that's true. City governments can make laws. We don't call them statutes here in Florida. We call them ordinances. We can make ordinances, says the sanctuary city, and we don't like the federal law. So here within the boundaries of our city, we're going to outlaw federal law, says the sanctuary city. But what's been the inevitable outcome of that? Yes. The court will kind of supersede and say federal law kind of takes control there. Correct. We've seen in those news stories that invariably federal law here in the USA overrides, or you might say preempts local laws. Yes, that has been the outcome. Thank you. Is that contrary to the concept of subsidiarity? No, it's not. Because subsidiarity says that the community of the higher order should not interfere with the community of the lower order, but should support it and help to coordinate it for the common good. We have set up here in our federal system a system where the federal government does have a role to play and is the superior sovereign. So as we look closer, we have, for example, very newsworthy. There's been this crazy thing going on. I don't know if you've seen it, called a coronavirus or COVID-19 or just plain old COVID. Anybody heard of this? Okay. Yeah. How's that? Something. And where is subsidiary falling with such a new story as that? What I have for you is the Holy Father himself in a few words. Now, I do apologize for one thing, and that is it's closed caption. Holy Father was speaking from Rome, and I got to be honest, I don't know what language that is he's speaking there. Maybe it's Italian, maybe it's Spanish. When you hear it, maybe you'll recognize it. I didn't recognize the language, but I was able to read the English closed captions at the bottom, so hopefully you will too. And let me play that. 
To emerge there from a crisis, the principles of subsidiarity must be enacted. Respecting the authority and the capacity to take initiative that everyone has, especially the least. All the parts of the body are necessary. As St. Paul says, we have heard that those parts that may seem the weakest and least important in reality are the most necessary. During the lockdown, the spontaneous gesture of applauding, applause for doctors and nurses began as a sign of encouragement and hope. Let's applaud. The castaways, those whom culture defines as those to be thrown out, this throwaway culture that is. Let's applaud the elderly, the children, persons with disability. Let's applaud workers, all who dedicate themselves to service. I believe my translation was perfect. That was only because I was reading, I was reading the closed caption at the bottom. But what's the Holy Father trying to say there? Is subsidiarity some sort of politics? Or does it go beyond that? I suggest it goes beyond that. I suggest, regardless of what side of the aisle you might be on, I don't care what you call yourself, Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal. I think. You agree on concepts such as human dignity, solidarity, and subsidiarity. I think these concepts reflect more than just a description of the politics of the day. I believe they go further and they reflect basic human needs. Now, has it been odd, I'm here at a law school teaching a secular topic like constitutional law, has it been odd for me to turn to the Holy Father, to turn to the writings of the saints, like St. Saint Pope John Paul II, to turn to biblical quotes? And if it has, then I ask you to open-mindedly consider this. Step away for a minute. And consider this. Imagine you are researching a beloved topic, just like I often research subsidiarity. Um, but whatever your beloved topic is, imagine you're researching it. And you've heard that there's this organization whose goal is to be apolitical, whose goal is the betterment of mankind, whose goal is to do the work. And they've been at it. Maybe they've been at it for a decade. You'd want to hear what that group had to say. You might not agree with it, right? Maybe they've been at it for a century, this group. Again, they've probably gathered some insights. You might not agree with their conclusions, but as a good researcher, can you ignore that group's work? Imagine if that group has been at it for 2,000 years, and I don't exaggerate. That's what the Catholic Church has been doing for 2,000 years, researching topics such as this. And you know, when we talk about research, we think about, well, what about what about the biases, right? Who's paying the researchers? Well, with that in mind, look at the Catholic Church, look at these researchers, look at some of the vows they take. Poverty, chastity, obedience. Did the, did the group pay off the researchers for their results? Well, these researchers took a vow of poverty they won't accept any more money than it takes to eat. Ever seen the monks? They've got like rope around their waist. That's not to be trendy. It's because they don't own a belt. They've taken a vow of poverty. Well, they got to get home. They didn't do the work. They got to take care of the kids. They got to take care of the wife. A vow of chastity. A vow of obedience. Agree? Disagree? That's up to you. But can you ignore such a group and its research and its conclusions and still call yourself a good legal researcher? I suggest you can't. So I didn't and I won't. 
So that's where I'm coming from when I turn to biblical sources, when I turn to the writings of the saints, when I turn to the words of the Holy Father. And again, I don't wish to make you feel awkward. I don't wish to make you feel out of place. Instead, please be open-minded and think to yourself, well, I hope this isn't true. Even if you don't like Catholics, maybe it's okay to hear what they have to say. After all, if you want to reject us, shouldn't you, you at least hear us out first? So that's where I'm coming from here. Finish it. Sorry, Holy Father, I already played your video. All right, so then if this is true, if subsidiarity is a basic human need, and if subsidiarity causes us consciously or subconsciously to have things such as subnational organizations and to have things such as governing documents like a subnational constitution for those organizations, if that's a basic human need, then is it a human need that we should quash, we should squash, we should contain? Or could there be some benefit to this? And to help us answer that question, I put forth a legal concept. Laboratory of democracy. There it is over there. What do I mean by laboratory of democracy? Well, what we're talking about there is perhaps illustrated by the case of State versus Horowitz. This is a Supreme Court called the State of Florida case that came out about six years ago. What happened in State versus Horowitz? The state wanted to imprison Ms. Horowitz, wanted to take away Ms. Horowitz's freedom. Ms. Horowitz wasn't being sued for money. Ms. Horowitz was a criminal defendant. Ms. Horowitz was going to be put in a clink. And I dare say she did not want to be there. Now, there was some questioning of Ms. Horowitz prior to, or there was some behavior of Ms. Horowitz prior to her being read her Miranda rights. And the state wished to testify as to that behavior, testimony from the eyewitnesses of Ms. Horowitz's behavior, because that behavior, the state believed, would help incriminate Ms. Horowitz. In other words, they wanted to use her own actions against her. Her attorney, attempting to keep her free, and keep her out of jail, tried to quash that evidence and exclude it. But what the trial court found and what the Supreme Court of Florida agreed was that the federal constitution did not, N-O-T, did not preclude the admissibility of that evidence. It was admissible despite Miranda and its progeny, despite the federal constitution and its bill of rights, this was still admissible. So did the Supreme Court of Florida stop there? There was no federal constitutional right. Did it stop there? If you've read the case, if you've read it, you know that the answer is no. They turned to another source of human rights, at least insofar as Ms. Horowitz's human rights were concerned, what was that other source? Yeah. Oh, the, Constitution. the Constitution of the state of Florida. So they turned to it not for some nuts and bolts kind of thing, like which court has jurisdiction or, you know, what do we call the equivalent of president, governor, or vice president, lieutenant governor. No, they turned to it for human rights. And indeed, does the Florida Constitution talk about human rights? Yeah. It's not like the Bill of Rights where somebody added it as some amendments at the back. It's Article 1, Section 1. It's page 1 of Florida's Constitution where we spell out rights of Floridians. So the Supreme Court of Florida turned there. What they found was some language that looked a lot like the text of the federal Constitution. But the Supreme Court of Florida noted something. And this is something you'll need to know, too, that as our state's highest court, it is the Supreme Court of Florida that is the ultimate arbiter of the meaning 
of the text of the Constitution of the state of Florida. So who gets the final say as to what the plain meaning of the text of Florida's Constitution is? In State versus Horowitz, the Supreme Court of Florida correctly held that it was the Supreme Court of Florida. They held it was them. They were right. With that power clearly grasped, they then turned to Florida's Constitution. And they found that as a Floridian who's threatened with the loss of her freedom by the state of Florida, Ms. Horowitz had greater rights under Florida's Constitution than Americans have under the federal Constitution. It was under that greater state constitutional right that Ms. Horowitz was protected and her pre-Miranda behavior, not statements, behavior, became inadmissible. Inadmissible under the federal constitution? No. Inadmissible under Florida's constitution? Yes. So State versus Horowitz shows us something. It shows us how one might use and create a laboratory of democracy. What's meant by that? Imagine this. Imagine a nation made up of 50 states, a district of Columbia, Puerto Rico, Guam, territories, let's not leave out the territories. Imagine each granting nothing less, nothing less than the full panoply of federal constitutional rights to all of its residents. But while so doing, experimenting with granting its own residents even greater rights. We call this concept the laboratory of democracy. And if you think about it, it's kind of, it's kind of a neat little analogy there, right? Anybody with a scientific background, anybody actually go in a laboratory in order to earn their bachelor's degree? It wasn't me, I was a business major. Yes, you were. Yes, now again, I was a business major. I wasn't in a laboratory like you were, sir, so you'll correct me if I'm wrong. But sometimes, despite all the precautions, the experiment blows up in your face. Am I wrong about that? I'm not wrong about that. I got one right today, folks. All right, so sometimes the experiment can blow up in your face, like, like telling me to use WebEx, right? Blow up in my face. Yeah, so sometimes, <laughs> or was it Zoom? I don't know. I don't know. I'm on YouTube if you need me. Okay, so sometimes the experiment can blow up in your face. Sir, in your experience in the laboratory, what precautions were taken just in case an experiment blew up in somebody's face? Glass pane. Yeah, like my plexiglass here, protecting me from you, you from me. I don't know which. I like that. All right. And let me repeat back so everybody heard it. And by paraphrasing you, sir, you'll correct me and make sure I understood it. But much like the plexiglass here that allows me to take off the mask, or at least I hope it does. CDC is changing every moment, right? Just like the plexiglass that allows us to take off, take off the mask, there was, there was some sort of like walled in, some sort of like contraption, some sort of like protection, so that if that particular experiment blew up, the rest of the lab didn't blow up with it. Yeah. All right, all right, I got it right. And since that's true, then this concept of laboratory democracy is particularly apropos because that's how our federal system works. Follow me now. Say, for example, and I know a lot of you haven't really cracked the book, so sorry to be referring to it here, but imagine just for a moment that you've got three sovereigns. You have a nation, the USA, with its federal constitution. Okay? You have a state, the state of Florida, with the Florida Constitution. And you have a group within Florida that is going to make use of those greater rights 
that were granted to the group by the state constitution. But what if in so doing, things go really bad? That's the beauty of our federal system. Much like in your lab, sir, you had the plexiglass to contain the damage done by that one experiment that blew up. We have a federal constitution and a concept of federalism that can contain the damage if a state blows up. Here's an example for you. Time was the 1970s. Now, I was born in 71, so I don't remember much of it. But I do remember being six or seven or eight years old, sitting in the car for like two hours to get some gasoline. I do remember being broke because I grew up broke. I don't know if that had anything to do with the 70s. But I remember the economy was in turmoil. That was true all over our nation. And it was certainly true in a particular state, who I won't name because I don't want to embarrass the state that put in its state constitution that its citizens were protected from usurious interest rates. Their usury law was in their constitution and their citizens were protected from any rate greater than 12%. Well, in the 70s, as the economy became what it was, no one was lending money at 12% anymore. You might borrow money at 15%, or 18%, or 21% back then, but you certainly were not getting a mortgage at 12% or less. But in this particular state, its citizens were protected from any higher interest rate. In this particular state, no lender could make a profit. In this particular state, no lender was making mortgages and loans. If you're in this state, thanks to the protection in your state constitution, you can no longer buy a house if you needed a mortgage. You can no longer buy a car if you needed a car loan. So what did the senators, U.S. senators, and U.S. representatives from that state do? They went to the U.S. Senate, they went to the U.S. House of Representatives and they passed a federal law that said it was not usurious. How'd that work? Why did that work? Why was that successful? And the answer to that has to do with the text of the U.S. Constitution. Some of you are honest with me, you spent three or four credit hours and never read, read the document because you're never asked to. I understand, I understand. But this quote is from the 10th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The power is not delegated to the United States by the federal constitution, nor prohibited to the states, or reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. It's a beautiful notion. But if you carried around that thick con law book and you read the case law, you probably noticed that there was this brief period of time well, nobody ever won in front of the Supreme Court of the United States in reliance upon that language. Brief period of time, 72 years. What's that, two, three generations of humans? So what instead we need to look at is the supremacy clause. This is not in an amendment. This is in the text of the U.S. Constitution. I am quoting from Article 6. This Constitution... Talking about the federal constitution, that's what I'm reading from. I know you haven't read from it before, but it's there. You could read it. This constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treatises made, or which shall be made, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the constitutional laws of any state, to the contrary, notwithstanding. Anything, anything in the constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. Notwithstanding means what? That they lose, right? That they're preempted, if you will. That federal overrides state. That's what the supremacy clause says. 
when each state joined the union, it signed on to a constitution, which says in Article 6 that the laws of that state are not supreme. What is supreme? The U.S. Constitution? Certainly. The laws of the United States? Certainly. We take you back to my story. Remember my story about the 1970s and the usury law. And the senators and representatives went to Congress, the federal Congress, to pass the law. Under the supremacy clause, even though the state constitution said the contrary, anything in the constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. Federal wins. Let's use the, let's use the dry erase marker. I may struggle with WebEx, but I can handle dry erase markers. All right, let's use the dry erase marker. Let's look at two sovereigns, shall we? The blue's a little light. Let's look at two sovereigns, shall we? Is the black any better? I know, I can barely see the black. You know, I can, I can like, I can like uh, make bubble letters, I guess. All right, so you got the U.S., right? Make a bubble letter of a U, a bubble letter of an S. Does that help us see it? I'm still having trouble seeing it. All right, and then we're going to have uh, Florida over here. I get my F just right. I guess FLA is the blue book abbreviation, right? I'm going to go with the post office abbreviation, the same thing. All right, Florida, okay? Now, the U.S. has a constitution, right? Anyone want to take issue with me on this premise? Anybody need me to prove this? The U.S. Constitution is the highest of federal laws that the federal government enacts. Anybody disagree? Good. Okay, good. We don't have to start there. All right, there is one higher law, though, right? See it up here in the big board? Treaties. Yeah. Can the president sign and then the Congress approve a treaty that would eliminate civil rights included in the federal constitution under that language from article six of the federal constitution the potential answer is yes so watch out for that but that's a different class sorry about the tangent let's just call the u.s constitution the highest federal law right are there any laws that are really high but not as high heard, heard, heard of the u.s code you've heard of the u.s code please say yes yeah, yeah, okay, right? Congress passes a law, right? But that might not be the other, only sort of law. Case law precedent, heard of that? All right, we'll just put case law. But you know what I'm talking about? Like maybe SCOTUS is ruling, something like that, right? Oh, different le levels of case law precedent, right? You might have SCOTUS, following my abbreviation, Supreme Court of the United States, SCOTUS. Follow that, right? Okay. I want to make sure we all understand what I'm saying when I say SCOTUS. I'm talking about the United States Supreme Court, right? But you also might get one of the federal circuit courts, right? Those are appellate courts, are they not? Or you might have a U.S. district court. For the most part, those are trial courts, right? Okay? And there's other federal courts. I'll just put those three on a big board. Sound good? What's another source of federal law? Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes. Let's talk about... Uh, Administrative code, right? So you find those in the administrative code. You might see it running in the federal register, right? Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. All right. How about this? Is this one controversial? How about common law? Erie versus Tompkins. Limited most, but not all federal common law, right? We still have the law of state versus states. We still have the riparian rights like rivers and waterways, right? So there's a little bit of common law over there. Not much, but it's low. We'll put it down. We got room for it. Anybody else got another source of federal law? Federal law. Yes. Regulations. Yeah. From who? Who are these regulations from? Uh, from the organizations in the government. Right. I mean, they're appointed, right? These agency heads are appointed. They're not elected by the people, but they're appointed, and they. Pass rules and regulations, and they're binding on the states. 
So we've got a we've got an unelected, appointed agency head. All right? Let's get her or him down there. It's pretty low. Maybe it's a low budget agency. So low budget. Maybe it's an unpopular agency. Unpopular. So we got at the lowest of the low there, we got an unpopular, low budget, unelected agency head. All right, so here's our sources of federal law. Let's take a look at some sources of state law. What is the highest expression of a state's law? Thank you, state constitution. That's why we're here. Yeah. All right, so over here, I got to move my line because he's, man, so much federal law. Look at all the space it's taken. Federal law is just bulging out on me here. All right, so we got a lot of federal law. It's bulging, bulging. But we also have a We've got a constitution here in the state of Florida. It's worth something. It's worth something. Ms. Horowitz, right? In the state first Horowitz, we just talked about. Kept her out of the clink. It's worth something, right? What else do we have? Florida statutes, right? Do we have case law here in Florida? Sure we do. We just heard a decision from the Supreme Court of Florida. We've got other courts, like district courts repeal, right? So we've got the Florida Supreme Court. Is that name a misnomer? Is the Florida Supreme Court really so supreme? I'm going to teach you in this class that that might just be a misnomer. It may not be so supreme. Ooh. More on that later. <laughs> well, we've got the Florida Supreme Court. We also have our district courts of appeal. Five of those. Right? We've got 67. Circuit courts, we've even got county courts, we've even got traffic courts. Anybody here been in traffic court? Slow down, man. <laughs> all right, so we've got case law from all those courts. Don't we have, you were kind enough to mention, federal administrative law. How about state administrative law? Yeah, chapter 120. Right? Florida statutes creates a Florida administrative code. So we got that. What about common law? Lots of Florida common law, right? Get that on the big board. We have any agencies around here? You betcha. Lots of state agencies. They have agency heads. They might be unelected. They're unpopular, low budget. We'll put the agency head over here. All right, what's my point in doing this? I want to illustrate the laboratory of democracy. I want to illustrate the safety equipment. I want to illustrate how it is that federal interacts with state when it is that state overrides federal. Okay, so yes. I just have a quick question. So quick question, you, all right. I'll have a quick answer. Your local or municipal True. Law, is that a quick enough answer? Not yet. <laughs> Go right ahead. I apologize for interrupting. Would that fall under Florida in, in this thinking, or would that be some separate problem that we're not getting? Because I talked over your question, I have to. I ask you to repeat it. I apologize. <laughs> Your local and municipal laws or regulations or oh, ordinances, yeah. would they fall under the Florida category here? Or yes. Would they be their own next? Nope, nope. We're going to put those under Florida because as you'll learn as our semester progresses, state and local governments such as municipalities, counties, cities, when they pass laws, whether they're ordinances or resolutions, it is because of a source of authority which is Maybe home rule that we find in the text of the Florida Constitution, or it may be a home rule statute that we find within the Florida statutes. But either way, that local government needs a source of authority for its lawmaking. Right. And my understanding is that those local authorities, Florida has basically a supremacy clause version for those. So it's almost like they're a separate, a third tier level. You are correct. Okay. And I'll end my answer by saying that. Because I've got an entire chapter that's going to explore exactly what you're talking about. I'm going to talk about when is it that state preempts local? When does local preempt state? Could a city's ordinance prevail over the county? We're going to explore all of that in an upcoming chapter. I believe it's chapter four. And I've got two hours of lecture on that. <laughs> so forgive me if I don't give you a full answer today. But man, you're getting an earful before the semester's over. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you.
So now on the big board, we've got US, we've got Florida. Say Florida sees a problem. Florida wants to grant a greater right to its citizens, or maybe Florida just wants to speak where the US is not, okay? What source, how high up do I have to go? To explore this, to ask you some hypotheticals, let's think of it as like a scoreboard for a minute, shall we? Say we're keeping score. Say it's state versus bad, all right? I want to pass a law. So Tallahassee helps me out. We've got in Tallahassee a bicameral legislature. We have a Florida Senate, a Florida House of Representatives. They duly enact a law. What if it's contrary to the U.S. Constitution? Which prevails? Which? The federal constitution. You are correct. On the scoreboard now, feds won. Florida zero. Woo. All right, that's okay. It's okay. It's all right. We put it before the people. We amended the constitution of the state of Florida. Now the constitution of the state of Florida clearly directly contradicts the U.S. Constitution. This is the highest expression of state law. We have no higher means. This is the top. And it contradicts the text of the U.S. Constitution. Which one wins? Yes? Well, it actually depends because it contradicts it in a good way by giving us more rights, then that would be okay. It's the problem that they give us less rights, right? Okay, so all right. So you give us a very nuanced way of saying federal wins, which is the correct answer. <laughs> and in your nuanced way, I like it because the concept of a laboratory democracy would mean that we can experiment with giving Floridians greater rights, but only if what? We never deny the full panoply of federal rights, the full panoply. What is the source of our federal rights? Certainly some of them are in the US Constitution, but is that the only source of human rights? Is that the only source of civil rights? Is that the only source of human rights? No, the US Code can be a valid, binding, and authoritative source of human rights, civil rights. So can case law. So can federal administrative law. Think about this. What if Florida's constitution violates the federal constitution? Which wins? The easy answer is this. Federal wins. Think about this. Supreme Court of the United States in U.S. versus Windsor, 2013 holding, held unconstitutional the Defense of Marriage Act's exclusion of same-sex couples from the definition of marriage. Likewise, I always mispronounce this, I apologize. Obergefell, if I pronounce it right, versus Hodges, a 2015 decision of SCOTUS, said that states may not deprive same-sex couples of a marriage license. Compare that to this exact quote, quoting it verbatim from Article 1, Section 27 of Florida's Constitution. And you see it on the big board right there. In as much as marriage is the legal union of only one man and one woman as husband and wife, no other legal union that is treated as marriage or the substantial equivalent thereof shall be valid or recognized. That's in the text of Florida's Constitution. I've got a class website for you, flaconstitution.com. On the home page, you can click and you can read the current text of Florida's Constitution. When was this language deleted from Article 1, Section 27? Trick question. It wasn't. Click on the Florida Constitution, which is required reading for this class. It's still there. It's still there. So does Florida's Constitution contradict the U.S. Constitution? According to SCOTUS, where's SCOTUS? It's not here. It's not here. Oh, it's over here. It's in the middle of the road, I guess, in rank. Middle of the road and rank over here outranks the highest expression of state law. 
That's what we mean by the laboratory of democracy. States may experiment with granting greater rights, but never, never may that experiment result in denying any of the full panoply of federal rights. Can't deny the federal rights you find in the text of the Constitution. Can't deny the federal rights you find in the United States Code. Can't deny the federal rights you find in case law from SCOTUS. Can't deny the federal rights you find from a circuit court that has territorial jurisdiction over Florida. Can't deny the human rights you find from the United States District Court trial opinion that comes from the state of Florida. Can't deny civil rights that come from the federal administrative code. Can't deny rights granted by an unpopular, low-budget, unelected agency head. What if the people of the state of Florida get together and add to their state constitution something, and then later an unpopular, <coughs> low-budget, unelected agency head says the opposite is federal law? Assuming the unpopular, low-budget, unelected agency head actually had the authority to say that, which one wins? Look at the matchup I've got here. I've got the highest expression of state law versus the rock bottom lowest pathetic expression of federal law. Which one wins? Federal wins. Why? Because of right here. Because of the supremacy clause from Article 6 of the federal constitution. So I can have as many matchups as you want. But this scoreboard's going to be a goose egg for state. Because no matter how low I go on the federal ladder, it still outranks even the highest expression of state rights. So with that answer having been provided to you, as we begin our 10-minute break, I leave you with the following cliffhanger. If anything, nearly anything of the federal law can trump even the highest expression of state law, such as the state constitution, then why are we here? Why are we studying subnational constitutions? Why do we bother to study subnational constitutional law? We're going to answer that question after this 10 minute break. Spoiler alert! It has something to do with subsidiarity. See you in 10 minutes.
So how's the how's the volume? Can you all hear me in the back? Is it hard to hear me? <laughs> okay, yeah. Is is that is that true in all parts of the room? Is it am I hard to hear? Yes. I am, I'm hard to hear. Right now. Oh, right now. Yeah. Oh, okay, all right. No, 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 because oh yeah, no. I wasn't trying to criticize everyone's break talking. No, I just wanted to check the volume in the room. Am I the room's got nice acoustics, so I'm hoping I'm project, projecting well enough. Oh, you, you're in the back row and you gave me thumbs up. Yes, and we had a conversation. And you're in the back row and you gave me thumbs up. Okay, all right. Because they, they've got microphones over here. I'm sure they work great. So if I need them, just let me know. I'll, I'll put them on. I'll put them on. So, all right. So welcome back. I, I know how you spent the 10-minute the break. I know you gathered into groups and you debated. What is what is the answer? What is it? Subsida who? You said. Subsida what? No, no, no. Anyway, so I left you with a cliffhanger because that's what good theater does, right? Gives you a reason to come back from intermission. And I like intermission in this classroom because the cafeteria is next door. I'm telling you, this is, this is a nice room. It looks like a courtroom, right? It's got the nice technology and the cafeteria is next door. And, and I, got a, I got a beautiful... Crucifix right there under the under the clock. Yeah, it's a well done room. It's well done. Yeah. So now, why bother having a state constitution if you can outrank it even at the lowest federal level? Who wants to give me an answer to that? Oh, and I have more than one way to participate. I hope you noticed on the home page. I saw you raise your hand. I'm gonna call on you just a minute, sir. On the home page, and you can click on the link. And you can type your question. So maybe you're you're not here live today for whatever reason, like I am. You can type your question there, and uh, who knows? I might answer it. I might leave you hanging like I did with this gentleman. There. Sorry, I left you hanging, sir. Go ahead with the, with your uh, kind of comment. Yeah, yeah. That's what. That's one great reason. I love that. Let me get that on the screen. Sorry to erase all this. Wonderful, but you got the point of this, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the state constitution certainly is the highest expression of state law, but even that highest expression of state law can, doesn't have to be, but can be overcome, can be preempted by federal law. So give me your point again, sir. So put it on the big board. Yeah, so the federal then, 
We've got a federal limitation. How would you best describe that limitation? Uh, yeah, you are correct. In this system we just described, this is a federal limitation upon state law, state authority, state constitutional law, state statutes, state and local ordinances. How would you describe that limitation? Well, the legislature can't violate the rights that are provided under the state constitution. Yes, yes, that's a way to describe it because what you're saying is what I was saying earlier in that the federal limitation is that the state cannot deny its citizens the full panoply of federal rights. And I think I've chosen my words wisely there. I didn't say the state constitution can't deny federal constitutional rights. I didn't say a limited statement like that. I talked about the full panoply of federal rights. Can you think of a human right, a constitutional right, uh, a civil right that derives from something other than the text of the US Constitution? Of course you can. We had one on the board a minute ago when we were comparing two SCOTUS decisions with Article 1, Section 27 when it came to marriage, right? What was the source of that right? Was it the text of the US Constitution? No. It was the text of the Supreme Court of the United States opinions that was the source of the right. What's another potential source of civil rights, of human rights on the federal U.S. level? Yes. Federal code. Federal code. Can the Congress get together and enact civil rights? Indeed, isn't there a U.S. Civil Rights Act? Yes, there is. So yes, we can create federal rights and find human rights for all Americans in places other than the text of the U.S. Constitution and SCOTUS decisions, we can have our elected officials get together and enact laws on the federal level that become our federal human rights. If I have a pre-existing condition, I still have the right to buy a health insurance policy. Is that in the U.S. Constitution? No. Is that in the SCOTUS decision? No, that's in the U.S. Code. In a democracy, we can vote and enact civil rights. We don't have to hope and pray that someone files a suit that then goes to trial, that then goes to appeal, that then is dis taken on discretionary review by the Supreme Court of the United States, that then goes our way. That's not the only source of human rights or civil rights. But for the big board, yeah, it's a federal limitation. And I missed a hand, this direction, no? Yes, yeah, yes, right. go right ahead. Sorry to miss your hand earlier. I was just gonna give another. Please do, I gotta fill the big board, it's big. Yeah, well, it's basically the floor of the right. Ah, oh, love it. It's the floor. I feel like I shouldn't write that up here, I should write it down there, right? Yeah, it's the floor. What's meant by that? Love that analogy. Than yeah, I love that analogy. I, I often use my girth, I'm heavy, you might have noticed, to help illustrate that, okay? It's the full. Think of the state constitution as the weightiest, the strongest, the heaviest, the highest expression of state rights. In other words, think of it as a heavy guy like me. But the federal is the floor. Look at this floor. I'm heavy, right? I'm going to jump on this floor. I'm jumping on this floor. Did I crash through the floor? No. And I'm going to eat some more ice cream tonight before I go to bed. But I'm going to get heavier and I'm not going to crash through this floor. The full panoply of federal rights are a floor. I don't care how high up the ladder of state authority you go, you can never be heavy enough to crash through the floor. Thank you, I love that. So you see where we're going with this. Since we're going there, let's take a look at the question on the big board. What if Florida's constitution violates the federal constitution? Clearly the text of the US constitution prevails 
or any state or federal law. But in order for federal law to preempt state law, how lofty and powerful must the federal source be? I hope you know that answer by now. But that's a very high or lofty at all, does it? What if the federal law was something less than the text of the US Constitution? Can it still preempt state law? The answer is yes. What sources of federal law are powerful enough to overcome even the state's highest and most powerful expression of state law, the state's constitution? Assuming each federal authority had authority to enact what it did, then no matter how low that federal source was, it still preempts all state laws, even the highest expression of state law, even the state constitution. In the battle between the state's constitution and a federal law, which federal laws win? All validly enacted federal laws for which the enactor had authority win. They all win. Well, McGinley, I hear you, but I've been following the news. I watch Fox News every night, and I see how sometimes the state can win. Well, if the state can prove that the federal lacked authority to enact that law, stated somewhat differently, if the federal can prove that it's not a valid law, it's not a valid federal law, it's not a valid federal enactment, then they've changed the playing field then it's not state law versus federal, it's state law versus nothing. And state law versus nothing, state law wins, at least until what? State law speaks up. <laughs> so how can that story end? Well, state might go to court, prove that federal authority wasn't there, didn't have the authority to enact that, wasn't properly enacted, what have you. And after that decision, the federal can gear up, enact a valid federal law, and win the end of the day, right? Make sense? Are we following what I'm trying to sell? Perhaps this famous quote from the US Supreme Court justice said it best, when it comes to the Supreme Court of the United States, they are not final because they're infallible, they're infallible because they're final. In other words, if the Supreme Court of the United States creates whole cloth, a civil right, a human right, that just didn't exist before that Supreme Court of the United States opinion, that just isn't in the text of the US Constitution, isn't in the US Code, isn't in the Code of Federal Regulations, isn't in the Federal Register, isn't in the binding federal case law precedent, isn't in any agency head's discretion, but they do it anyway. Where do you appeal to? When it comes to Supreme Court of the United States, they are aptly named. They are the Supreme Court of the United States. There's nowhere else to appeal to. You can amend the federal constitution, you can sign and have Congress approve an international treaty. How often do these things happen? Not very often. Other than those avenues, what do you do about a SCOTUS decision you don't like? You live with it. Well, let's be a sanctuary state. Yeah. Does that work? No, it does not. Let's be a sanctuary city. At least in this context, that does not work either. Yes? Well, it can't work legally, it can't work practically. Can it? Can a bus you for an example? What? Oh, I, I, was, I was like playing with the word cannabis, and I was like saying, oh. can I ask you for an example? But I was like trying to give you a hint. As I said, can I ask you for an example? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that's all right. Hey, I wasn't what I had in mind either. <laughs> oh, <okay>. hmm? <laughs> well, what did you have in mind? What was your example that you were thinking of? And you're giving me an example, if I'm hearing you right, of federal preempt state, but federal 
just sitting on its rights. Federal is not doing its job. Federal is not enforcing federal law. That's which that's where you're going, are you not? Yeah. That can happen. That can happen in the relationship between the federal government and the state government. It could be illegal under federal law. Now, is the state's are the state's judges supposed to do that? Okay. If we look at the supremacy clause of the plain text of the U.S. Constitution in Article 6, it says here that the judges in every state shall be bound by federal law. It's a recent opinion from, and when I say recent, I'm talking days old, from Florida's first district court of appeal. It's a workers' compensation case. The injured worker got a prescription for marijuana. Allegedly, the marijuana had medicinal benefits as to this injured worker. The District Court of Appeal held that they were bound by federal law that says it's a, not a medicine, it's an illegal drug, and therefore they would not interpret Chapter 440 Florida statutes, the Florida Workers' Compensation Law, to include cannabis or marijuana as a medicine, as a drug, as a treatment under Florida workers' compensation. So that very recent decision is an example of what the plain text of the U.S. Constitution says here when it says that even the judges of the states are bound by federal law. But you are correct. What if somebody's not doing their job? What if there's a federal law that binds us, but it's not being enforced? For better or for worse, we see a lot of that in the news, in the modern era. You pointed out immigration. I pointed out cannabis and marijuana. We could all point out various examples of things that the federal government's supposed to be doing if it's following federal law, and it just isn't. So you talk about the practical effects, and I have to acknowledge those. But I also have to teach a law school class. I have to teach you how to think like lawyers. I have to give you the skills to litigate and negotiate. I have to make you more than just pundits. It's one thing to be able to lament that your client's constitutional rights have been violated. It's a whole other thing to have the power to do something about it. I'm not here to make you a talking head or a pundit. I'm here to empower you. I'm here to help you not only identify a constitutional violation, but to have the power to do something about it. So I'd be remiss if I simply told you, just go to your state legislature and pass a law or get on the city council and declare yourself a sanctuary city. Because the way our federal system works today as I speak to you, those means are doomed to failure, they're not going to work. Are there situations where the sovereign with the power is not exerting that power? Of course, we named so many examples. And we can be pundits and we can talk about whether that's good or bad. But here in a law school, I need to give you the technical skills to make the arguments and bring the litigation. So that's what I'm focused on. Yes. I had a question. I wanted to go back to the case that you were discussing. State v. Um, Harwitz. No. No. Um, the medical marijuana. The, the medical marijuana, marijuana case, a few days old. Right. Yes. So I I remember that the Florida Constitution actually addresses medical marijuana. Mm. And so did the court there just choose to, to not follow the Constitution? Of Florida and go with the feds? Yes. Or, um, okay. The court said that the text of the supremacy clause of the U.S. Constitution, Article 6, says what it says that the judges of every state, including Florida, are bound by the laws. Which laws? The Constitution, right? And the laws made pursuant to the Constitution. No. Which are those? Those are all the laws that aren't unconstitutional. So that's the U.S. Code, that's binding case law precedent from federal courts. That's the Code of Federal Regulations. That's the Federal Register. That's the agency heads who promulgate emergency rules that apply to the extent that they have the authority to do so. 
To the extent that those federal sources are not unconstitutional, then they are among the Constitution and the laws which are made in pursuance thereof. Those are preempting state law. So yeah, that was the ruling of the three-judge panel from the First District Court of Appeal in that Florida workers' compensation case that came out literally days ago. It's still within the 10-day motion for 15-day motion for rehearing period. It's still within the 15-day motion for rehearing on Bonk, which would mean instead of a three-judge panel, the entire First District Court of Appeal judges could all take up the case. I don't know if there'll be a rehearing. I don't know if there'll be an on Bonk decision. As we stand here today, we've got a really fresh case in front of us. That's what it says, and that's why it says it. And when we look at what it says and why it says it, we see solid language in our U.S. Constitution that supports that decision. So then why would it even be in, our, in the Florida Constitution? Why would it even be in the Florida Constitution, knowing that they would just defer to the feds? Well, that's a great question, and you heard the question, right? Why are things in state constitutions that are unconstitutional? To, to paraphrase, that's your question, right? Essentially. So why are they there? And pundits have commented on this. Sometimes the state constitution went first, and then later it became unconstitutional. Now, constitution stays as it is until somebody amends it. The analogy I like to use is that there's no flying eraser. When SCOTUS renders an opinion, that doesn't send 50 flying erasers flying out of the Supreme Court of the United States, flying into the state capitals of the 50 states and erasing things from the Constitution. It's still there, physically there. Like when we looked at Article 1, Section 27, that was part of Florida's Constitution. It still is. It's as unconstitutional today as it was when SCOTUS ruled in 2017, but it's still there. Until someone physically starts the process of amending the state constitution, some part of it that became unconstitutional stays there. Another reason, some pundits point out, is sometimes some states, for political reasons, think there might be a change in federal law. And they want to have a state law on the books ready to be active and operative as soon as federal law changes. So, for example, Two of the things that we must overcome in our generation both have to do with a lack of respect for life. They are both abortion and euthanasia. Unfortunately, these two things are permissible, and soon we will be more enlightened, and we will not tolerate having the dignity of our fellow human beings attacked in either one of those ways. So there are some states that are trying to put laws on the books for when that day comes, those laws will then be operative. But as it stands today, those laws would be unconstitutional, but they might be enacted anyway. A third reason that some pundits point out is that they want to start the federal litigation process that might lead to unconstitutionality. For better or for worse, some of our human rights are hanging by a thread because nobody amended the federal constitution to put them there and nobody called up for a vote in the federal Congress to enact them into law. All there is is an opinion from perhaps even the US Supreme Court that some folks disagree with. And therefore that human right is hanging by a thread. As soon as the court can be convinced otherwise, and you've seen it, case law precedent sometimes is overruled. Then whatever human right existed in that overruled precedent then is lost. So some folks want to put things on the state books so that if that day comes, there's some other source for that human right. So that's three answers to that question that I've read about in my studies. The question being, why would you put something in a state constitution that's unconstitutional, or why would it still be there? Now, in Florida, until the year 2018, Article 1 of our Declaration of Rights said that it was legal for the Florida legislature, if it chose to do so, to deny Asian Americans the right to own or inherit or sell or buy real estate, real property within the state of Florida. That was on the books 
in Florida's constitution for just a little, little while. It was, uh, it was what, 1789 to 2018. So, you know, what's that? A couple hundred years or something like that. And why was it there? Clearly, it was unconstitutional. And no session of the Florida legislature ever, thank God, tried to pass a law that said that thing, even though that ugly thing was allegedly permissible according to the text of Florida's constitution. But it was there. Why did it stay there for so long? Well, it was on the ballot to repeal it. And the voters in the state of Florida voted down the repeal. They didn't repeal it. It didn't pass. It wasn't repealed. It wasn't until 2018 when its repeal was bundled with three other popular things. And since it came from the Florida Constitutional Revision Commission, it was allowed to be bundled. And the focus was on the three popular ones. And then finally, we erased that disgusting, bigoted, awful language from our constitution. But that's an example of how something can be unconstitutional in the state constitution, but still be there. The quick answer by analogy is because there's no flying eraser. Someone's got to take the time and the effort to remove the text. And since it's a democracy, even if you take the time and the effort to remove the text, it might not pass, as we saw with Florida's alien land law. Also found today in Article 1 of Florida's Constitution, it says that state money cannot be used to the benefit of any sectarian educational institution. What's a sectarian educational institution? You're sitting in one. I'm teaching in one. A sectarian educational institution, as intended by the drafters of that language that's in Florida's constitution, refers to a Catholic school or a Catholic university. There was, and perhaps there still is, a time where Catholics were less than popular and were discriminated against. A particular candidate who wanted to be U.S. president was riding the anti-Catholic wave and came up with these non-sectarian laws. He wasn't able to get them passed by the U.S. Congress, so he went state to state. Several states passed them, Florida being one of them, and it remains in Florida's constitution today. Can you discriminate? against me and my fellow Catholics because we are Catholic? I hope and pray that the answer is no. But if we look solely at the text of Florida's constitution, it would imply that the answer would be yes. And again, I hope and pray that the answer is no. But that, yet again, is another example. How could a state constitution be unconstitutional? There are so many examples as we go through our state constitutions. They exist. And these are some of the reasons why. But we know that we have the safety net. Anything in the constitutional laws or of any state to the contrary of federal law, that's the federal limitation. We can't sink below the floor. I'll try it again. I'll try my best. Can't sink below the floor. Remember the analogy, I'm the state constitution. That's the floor. I didn't sink. That's my point. So what if Florida's constitution violates the federal constitution? The federal constitution wins. And you see that in examples such as this. Remember that example. We talked about U.S. versus Windsor and Obergefell versus Hodges, if I pronounced it correctly. So of what use is the state constitution in light of the supremacy of the U.S. Constitution? If something is clearly stated in the U.S. Constitution, then that fact almost certainly means that it is the prevailing law of the land. Almost certainly means that that is the prevailing law of the land. But with any state constitution, including the Constitution of the State of Florida, we must proceed with caution and check for federal preemption before assuming the state constitution's provision is even an enforceable law, right? 
What if we just looked at Article 1, Section 27 when we're deciding whether or not to sell marriage licenses? Better look past that, right? Because there's more to that story, is there not? So in your federal constitutional law class where you never opened the text of the Constitution, you probably should have because that almost certainly was binding law. Here in your state constitutional law class where I'm making you read this time, the state constitution, you better be careful because that might not even be a binding law you're reading. Wow, how's that back from back? That's back. Yeah. A different, from, a different but related point. And here's where, hope I don't go off the rails. Bear with me here. Any state constitutional law jurisprudence, including Florida constitutional law jurisprudence, needs a firm foundation in federal law in order to thrive and flourish. What, 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 what? McKinley, where are you going with that, man? You are making sense till now. Bear with me. Here's where I'm going with that. Imagine you are the state of Florida. That's right, you. So you create a new human right, a new civil right. Now, it's one thing you know. You can't violate any of the full panoply of federal rights, right? You've got a federal limitation. Federal's the floor. But you didn't do that. Instead, you genuinely created a new right without violating any federal right, without sinking below the floor, without trying to exceed the federal limitation. Will that right always exist? What if the US Congress passes a law to the contrary? It's gone. What if the code of federal regulations can be interpreted to the contrary? It's gone. What if, remember this guy? The unpopular, unelected, low-budget federal agency head issues that emergency ruling. What happened to your beautiful state constitutional right? It's gone. That's the point I'm trying to make here. You want to have this laboratory of democracy? That's great. But at any moment, you turn away and you look back and the experiment's gone. <laughs> They're a law. Erased all your good work. That's the point I'm trying to make there. With that in mind, what questions do you have for me? Are we understanding this? Help me to know that you understand this. It's our first class. Best I can tell nobody's read the book yet. But who will answer some hypotheticals for me? Who will be voluntold? Thank you. All right. I'll give you an example. State constitution says, hypothetical state, hypothetical constitution, hypothetical thing that it says, landlords have a right to their rent. And the Centers for Something Control, CSC, says it's just not a good time for people to be out of their homes. No landlord in any state may evict anyone as long as that person is willing to sign a document that says this, this is a bad time for me to be out of my house. Which prevails? <laughs> Who agrees? Why do you agree? Yeah, that's right. Because of the supremacy clause in the text of the U.S. Constitution. <clears throat> the Constitution and all laws made pursuant thereof preempt state law. That's the right answer. But that was the easy part. Here's where it gets harder. You just signed up a new client, sir. A landlord who wants you to defend landlord's rights as written in the state's constitution. 
what are your options? Um, establish a set of regulations where the agency didn't have authority to pass that rule. Oh man, you're hitting a home run. I love this. Yes, everyone hear that? Option one, because you got more options. Option one was we're going to establish that the Center for Something Control lacked authority to pass that emergency rule. Why is this a good option one? And I agree, it is. Who can tell me why that's a good option one? Yes. Challenging higher federal authority. Yeah, beautifully put. You're challenging with higher federal authority. And if the challenge succeeds, then the Center for Something Controls emergency rule now isn't. Where'd that text go? Where'd my supremacy clause go? Here's my supremacy clause. Now, the Center for Something Controls emergency rule isn't made under the constitutional laws of the United States made pursuant thereof. It's without authority. It's unconstitutional. The law falls. But please note why the law fell. Did the law fall because the state constitution said otherwise? No. As you correctly stated, sir, thank you for stating it so well, it fell because federal law made the federal law fall. If I want to defeat the federal law, I'm going to have to turn to which source? Federal. Didn't matter how high up in rank, I went in state law. It wasn't high enough to outrank federal law. So if I'm going to kill the federal law, it's going to have to be a federal basis. Correct. And that is a beautiful explanation of why option one was a great option. But you had so many more options for your client. Client's paying by the hour and is rich. So you've got lots of options for this client. Go ahead. Go ahead. Tell me the, tell me the next option. The rule doesn't apply to the situation. Okay, I like that. You're going to factually distinguish it. Beautiful, beautiful. In so doing, you've left both laws on the books. You're just showing, as a matter of fact, that law doesn't apply. Not that it's invalid, not that it's unconstitutional, not that it falls. Yeah, yeah, it applies to everybody else, but my client, not my client, Your Honor. Great option. Option three. What if I go to the Code of Federal Regulations and state the opposite of that agency had. Assuming that code of federal regulations had authority to say that, and it was the opposite of the agency head's emergency rule, now I've overcome it, right? Yeah. Another option. What if I go to Congress? Now it's going to show up in the USC, United States Code. It says the opposite of what that agency head said. Now what happens to the agency head's emergency rule? I beat it again, right? So I'm signing up this client on four fronts. You and your three associates are going to work 40 hours a week billing this client's file. Well done, sir. Is that nice hand? Nice hand? Yes. There you go. One client, four attorneys working all day long. That's what we want. So the moral of the story is there is a state constitution, okay? Why is there a state constitution? Because there is a basic human need for that state constitution. Is that basic human need a benefit or a detriment? It's a benefit because it allows for a laboratory of democracy where each state within the federal limitation, never sinking below the floor, can experiment with new and greater human rights. If it blows up in their face, we have the protection of federal preemption and a supremacy clause. If it turns out to be beautiful, then we can inspire the other states, perhaps, to do the same in their state laws. Or we can inspire the federal government to enact federal law, and our human rights can bloom and flourish. But always with that caveat, we can never deny the full panoply of federal rights regardless of the source. With that said, are there times when there are state rights where Floridians have greater rights than Americans as a whole? The answer is yes, I wrote you a book about that. 
You're going to join me next week in chapter two, where we're going to talk about government transparency and accountability. My first question to you is going to be this. We know there's FISA. We know there's federal law that allows us to see and know, hopefully, what the government's trying to hide from us. Why do we need Florida sunshine laws? Why do we need parts of the state constitution and enacting statutes in the Florida statutes? Why do we need them to attempt to give Floridians even greater rights to government transparency and government accountability? That'll be my first question. Please read chapter two and I will see you in one week. Until then, may God continue to bless us all. And thank you for taking my class. Signing off.